Hello and welcome to the Just and Center podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. And I do just want to give you all another reminder that Just and Center as an organization is supported by donors. So we would ask that you would consider becoming a regular contributor to help out with all that we do. Now, this uh, program today is part of this Justin Center Essentials series that we just began recently. Uh, We did the first of those, which was an introduction to Lutheranism as a whole. And in that introduction to Lutheranism, you may want to listen to that one before this, but it's also not an absolute necessity to do that. Uh, But in that program, we talked about the history of Lutheranism, who Martin Luther was, some of the basics of Lutheran theology, quick overview, what the Lutheran confessions are, as well as who some of the major theologians or thinkers are within the tradition that is Lutheranism. Um, So today, what we're going to be doing is delving specifically into the theology of Lutheranism. So again, some of these points were overviewed quite briefly in the prior program, uh, but this is going to be delving a little more into this. Now, this is an overview. That's the purpose of this video. That's the purpose of the videos in this series in general, is that they are these broad overviews instead of these really deep dives into theological particulars. I got plenty of those on the channel. So nearly any topic that you want to look at here, if you want to look at more depth, uh, there are plenty of videos on this channel that you can check out there or in our our podcast history as well. Um, Particularly, I'll point you to the Augsburg Confession series, which uh, is a series that goes through all of the articles of the Augsburg Confession which is a primary Lutheran confession of faith. And uh, following that, I'm going to be doing actually a number of series on all of the other Lutheran confessions. So the the goal is, and it will take many years to get there, but (laughs) the goal with that series uh, is that eventually we'll have talks on every single article in the entire book of of Concord. All right, so we're going to be doing then this this overview of Lutheran Lutheran theology. Uh, So maybe some of you are very familiar with Lutheran theology, probably, and some of you, this is brand new. Maybe you've been sent this uh, or you're looking at this for the first time, not knowing what the heck Lutherans believe. Uh, And so hopefully we'll we'll help you out here. So we're going to look at some of the the key doctrines, the kind of key distinctives. Now, again, as an overview, we're not going to get into all of the particulars, and we are not going to hit every single doctrine. Particularly, we are going to be looking here really at those kind of distinctive doctrines of, of Lutheranism, the things that make Lutheran, the Lutheran tradition unique, the things that identify it as distinct from, say, the Reformed or the Roman Catholic or the Anglican traditions. So those distinctives are going to be the core of what we're talking about. Uh, That doesn't mean that these are the only things we care about. <laughs> so uh, we're not talking here about the doctrine of the Trinity. We care deeply about the doctrine of the Trinity. However, that's not really a Lutheran particular because that that the ideas of the the Trinity and what Lutherans believe about the Trinity is really a shared commonality within the Church Catholic, but particularly within that Western Trinitarian formation coming from uh, St. Augustine. There is a whole series of 20-something videos on this channel on the doctrine of the Trinity, if you want to delve into that. Okay, so we're going to start with what is probably the most kind of key identifying doctrine of Lutheranism. If you ask people, what are Lutherans? What do Lutherans believe? Most likely that doctrine of justification is going to come out first. Even if you read, say, a uh, history book uh, on just an overview of Western history, say, the doctrine of justification is going to show up if you have a little section on the Reformation. I I worked at a bookbinding factory uh, during summers during college, and at that bookbinding factory, we often bound school textbooks. We also bound the works of St. Augustine, which was pretty cool, but uh, we we bound these, uh, you know, school textbooks for largely for high schools, and every time we, we had a new, like, history textbook, I would always take a look at it to see what it said about Luther or Calvin and the Reformation, because it was always interesting to, to read the takes uh, and it, because it was largely not from from people within any Christian tradition so sometimes they were kind of, they were kind of wild takes but um, <laughs> but almost always there was an identification of Martin Luther and the Reformation with the idea of salvation by faith often using the term justification though sometimes they would just say things like saved by faith salvation by faith and not by works um, so this becomes the the key point around which, Lutherans are distinctively identified. So sometimes it's it's been said that this is justification is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. That's attributed to Martin Luther, and oftentimes that's 
phrase is is repeated. So that core of our theology really does spread outward toward the others. Now, anytime you're talking about doctrine, it's important to remember that they're not just these isolated little teachings. Like, it's not like you just have the doctrine of the Trinity over here, the doctrine of justification over here, you know, good works over here. But, but they're all intertwined. They relate to one another. And in terms of justification, while the Lutheran doctrine of justification, say, isn't going to give us a maybe distinctive doctrine of the Trinity over against a tradition that might have a different approach to, to justification. But what it is going to do is change the way that we speak about how we relate to the triune God, how it is that we communicate about the triune God, how he relates to us. So we're going to look then at just some key terms in terms of the doctrine of justification. Now, with everything that I'm looking at doctrinally here, I have verses listed in, in the slides in this PowerPoint. So if you're listening to the podcast, maybe I'll, I'll say some of these, but it, if you're listening to the podcast and you want to get the you know all of the texts, you're probably going to have to go back and, and visit the video just to be able to get uh, all the, the sources that I'm writing down. If I went through and read every single text in their context, this would be, you know, 20 hours long or something. So I can't, unfortunately can't do all of that, but I want you to be able to explore the text to talk about these things as well. So, so key terms, these are some of the, the kind of key ways of speaking about justification that, uh, that Lutherans have. Now, just to set the stage groundwork really quickly with the doctrine of justification, what do we mean by the term justification? Uh, the term justification means to make righteous or to declare righteous, and that's part, part of the debate that happens in the medieval period. But generally, the term justification is a term that has been used to talk about the Christian's salvation or the gift of salvation that God gives to the Christian in terms of the language of righteousness. And so if you look at the Greek term for righteousness and justice, they're the same term. So you may refer to this as righteousification, uh, but of course that doesn't quite sound as as uh, easy <laughs> to say. It doesn't sound quite as eloquent as justification. So uh, despite maybe some proposals that we use that term, it's maybe more accurate uh, justification is the one that, that sticks. And so in understanding justification, a term that Paul uses, especially in Romans and Galatians, there are debates among Christian traditions about exactly what justification means, though everybody agrees it has to do with righteousness and salvation. So here are terms that identify the unique Lutheran approach to the doctrine of justification. The first of these is imputed righteousness. Now, imputed means something that is, is counted. So to impute is to credit or account something. So to be imputed righteous then is that we are credited as righteous. And so what, and you can look at Paul's discussion of this in Romans 3 and 4. I have Romans 4, 6 mentioned, but Paul uses that term imputed or counted in terms of, of our righteousness. So the question here is, what is the righteousness that saves us? Is the righteousness that saves me, that, that gives me a right standing before God, is it something that is infused, which is the Roman Catholic terminology, into my soul? Does it have to do with an internal change of character that I stand before God as judged as righteous? Or is it something that God counts towards me or credits to me? Is it something that God declares about me? This then leads to the second term, which is alien righteousness. Alien righteousness, and I have Philippians 3.9, where Paul talks here about the righteousness that he had as a Pharisee, and he talks about how uh, he has a righteousness now as a Christian that is not his own, but that which is, is his that he has been granted as he is in Christ, uh, the righteousness which comes through faith. So you can read Philippians 3 and read Paul's whole discussion of that. But alien righteousness does not mean, you know, space aliens. It doesn't mean, you know, Wookiees or Klingons or Ithorians or something else. What we're talking about with alien righteousness is a righteousness that is from somewhere else, a righteousness that is from outside of me. And so related to that is the Latin phrase you'll often hear, extra nos, which means outside of us. The righteousness that saves us is not some kind of righteousness that you know originates in me. It is not something that I earn in some way because I try hard enough. I can't merit my own righteousness or, or increase my own righteousness and justification. Instead, the righteousness that saves me 
is the righteousness of someone else. In fact, it is the righteousness of Jesus. So I am counted righteous, not because of my own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus. So the righteousness of Christ covers me. I am judged as perfectly righteous because of that, not just as partially righteous, because no matter how much I progress or grow in my Christian life, I'm never going to have this perfect righteousness. I'm never going to achieve a state of pure sinlessness until I die and God strips that sinful flesh from me. And so my standing before God must be based on something that is not in me at all. In fact, it is based in Jesus Christ, his person and his work, what he has done for me. So this alien righteousness is counted to me, imputed to me, credited to me, so that I am seen as righteous before the eyes of God, before the judgment of God, so that I am not judged according to my sins. I am instead judged according to the one who took my sins upon himself. Then the next term that we have to describe righteousness here in justification is passive righteousness. Now, there is an act of righteousness as well that Christians engage in, but that's not justification. Passive righteousness is the idea that when I receive righteousness, it is not something that I am earning or that I am striving really hard for, but it's something that I am receiving. Martin Luther likes to use the example of you know, a beggar's hands so that my righteousness consists in the same kind of thing that a beggar does, right? If you have a beggar on the street who has nothing and the beggar wants money, uh, that beggar simply holds out, you know, his or her hands and the one giving the gift, the money, whatever it might be to the beggar just places the gift in their hands. In other words, the, the hands there are passive. Yeah, they're reaching them out, but they're not, you know, earning money. They're not doing anything. All they are simply being receptive to the gift that is being given. And so that's what we mean when we say that our righteousness is passive. Our righteousness is, is like that, that, that gift of money to the beggar. It is something that we come before God as beggars, as those who are in great need, not just need, you know, of earthly things, but in need of righteousness and eternal righteousness. And so we come before God passively, and God then gives us righteousness as a free gift. Romans 4, 5 is, is the text here that I cite where Paul talks about Abraham. And he says that, you know, Abraham did not work, but trusts in the one who justifies the ungodly. So Abraham, not offering any work before God, simply trusts in God's promises and God grants him righteousness. He is credited as righteous, as we see in Genesis 15, 6. Then we have this fourth term dealing with justification, which is subjective and objective justification. The text that I cite here is 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16 references Christ's own justification, Jesus's justification. Now, that sounds really odd. Why would Jesus need to be justified? Why would Jesus need to be declared righteous? Because Jesus was righteous. Well, this is how Jesus's righteousness differs from ours. We are, not, we are declared righteous, but not because we are righteous inherently in ourselves, but Jesus is declared righteous because he is righteous in himself. And so Jesus, through his death, took the, the penalty of our sins. He took the debt that our sins uh, built up before God. He took that debt upon himself. He paid the debt on our behalf. And then he rose from the dead. And in rising from the dead, God vindicated him. He was vindicated or justified by the Spirit, which is what Paul says here. And so what that means is that Jesus, at his resurrection, he was declared righteous. Why was Jesus righteous? He was righteous because he did fulfill the law according to every jot and tittle that God gave to us. And he did pay for and atone for the sins of the world. And he did raise from the dead, thereby assuring victory and righteousness to the people of God. So this is objective justification. So a justification, this declaration of righteousness has its basis in the reality of who Jesus is, that he was declared righteous because he is righteous. And our justification, our being imputed or counted as righteousness is what we call subjective justification, which is the reality that in faith, we are brought into the verdict that was placed on Jesus. So, faith unites me to Jesus, and 
faith brings me into the reality of his work. And so faith has this kind of connecting power. And because of that, in faith, I am connected to the verdict of righteousness that was placed on Jesus through his obedience, his death, and his resurrection. So I am subjectively justified, meaning that the, the work of Jesus is applied to me personally because I am brought into the reality of who Jesus is. And we're speaking about then justification and faith, because as we speak about justification within a Lutheran context, we also have that very important phrase, those three words, by faith alone, which is often the most contra uh, controversial aspect of this when you're dealing with, say, Roman Catholicism, that especially that little word alone that shows up there. So what is the role of faith in in, in relationship to that righteousness. Well, the first thing I say is faith is passive. And again, I have Romans 4, 5. We've talked about the passivity of righteousness. Faith, in other words, faith does not justify us because our faith does good works. Though our faith does do good works, but it doesn't justify us insofar as it has done enough good works. Faith justifies simply in its being passive and receiving Christ. So here's a, another illustration that, that Luther uses that I think is very helpful to explain this. Luther explains that faith is, is like the relationship between a ring and a jewel that that ring holds. Now you can have all sorts of rings that are made of precious metals here, but imagine a ring that is made of something like copper, very cheap material. We use it to make pennies, which are basically worthless. Um, and so picture you have a ring that is made of copper and that copper ring is grasping onto a, a large diamond, a diamond that's worth thousands of dollars. Now, if you grab onto that ring, which is both copper and the diamond, you'd say, wow, this ring is valuable. That ring would sell for a lot of money. Why is it valuable? Is it valuable because of the copper? No, of course not. Copper is basically worthless. But what makes it valuable is the diamond that that ring grasps onto. And so that is how our faith works. Why does our faith justify? Not because our faith is so good, because we have such strong, important faith, or we do such important, wonderful things for God. Instead, our faith justifies precisely because it grasps Christ. It grabs onto him as the precious jewel that he is. And so scripture does then speak about things like degrees of faith. There are people that have stronger faith. There are people that have weaker faith. However, the stronger faith versus weaker faith does not make anyone more justified than another. It's not that you are, you know, you are righteous in Christ because your faith is so strong. And there are, again, there are, there's weak faith and there's strong faith. But regardless of how strong your faith is, your righteousness before God is the same because it's not dependent upon your faith, but it's dependent upon Jesus. And in Christ, you have a perfect righteousness and therefore your justification is perfect. So you can't increase in terms of your justification. It's already perfect. Jesus has already taken care of it. You can't get more perfect than Jesus himself. Are there degrees? Is there growth in terms of your good works and your renewal in this life and what people often call sanctification. Yeah, of course, but not in terms of your righteous standing before God. That can't be increased. It can't be decreased. You're either righteous before God or you're not. And in Christ, through faith, you are righteous. We have then this other way of speaking about faith in terms of three elements of faith. And I'll go over these really quickly. These are Latin terms, notitia, ascensus, fiducia. What these mean is, notitia is that there is a, a knowledge. Faith has to have a knowledge of what the gospel is. You know, you have a knowledge of, you know, the facts, Jesus died for sins, Jesus rose from the dead. You got the knowledge. Ascensus is assent, so that faith assents to the fact that those things are true. But where faith is really, really lives is in this the third one, which is trust. So faith is essentially synonymous with trust, trust in God. So when we say justification by faith alone, what we're not saying is that faith is merely assent to a series of facts. It's not merely saying, okay, I know that Jesus died and rose for sins and I believe that this is the case. Assent does not constitute faith. Faith is trust, trust in God's promises and faith that his promises are for you. 
So faith is trusting that what Christ has done is for me. Now, faith also has uh, two powers. And I have a text there from Galatians 5, which speaks about faith working through love. And so faith has these, these two powers. It's got this kind of passive role, which is before God we receive righteousness. But then there is also a, an active power of faith, that faith then does live in love toward others. So while my good works aren't the thing that justify me before God, my good works are the way that faith shows itself and lives itself out in this world. And so my life of faith is both a receiving of the grace of God and an active doing of good works, fighting sin in my life, and serving the people around me. Then we move on to something very related to the doctrine of justification, and this is Luther's distinction between the law and the gospel. Now, there are many ways to speak about the law in the gospel. Both the term law and the term gospel have some different meanings in Scripture. So, if you actually go, you know, through the texts of Scripture and say, what does, say, the Greek term namos for law or, you know, Torah in the Old Testament, there are a number of, of Hebrew words that are kind of synonyms for that as well. You know, Psalm 119, for example, goes back and forth between a number of different, different terms. You can look at someone like St. Paul, and in the letter to the Romans, he has about four different ways that he uses the term namos which means law. So let's be specific about what we're talking about here because we're not identifying every time the Bible uses the term law or every time the Bible uses the term gospel because sometimes law means the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, or sometimes gospel means the gospels as in the, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But here we're talking in a particular way as, about the law as God's commands that he gives us, and then the gospel as the free promises that he gives us in Christ. Okay, so a way that we understand this distinction between law and gospel is commonly Lutheran pastors use this SOS way of speaking about this. SOS meaning that the law shows our sin and that the gospel shows our savior. So it's a helpful little device we often teach to confirmation students. It kind of sticks in your head, SOS, shows our sin, shows our savior. It's a pretty easy way to grasp the distinction between the law and the gospel. So the law shows our sin. We see that from Romans 3.20 I have here, which is the culmination of Paul's description of sin, where he says that, you know, before God, through the law, every mouth may be stopped and the whole world might be held accountable to God. And so the law reveals the reality of our sin. When we see God's commands, when we see the demands that he places upon us in their fullness and the, the, the completeness of, of what he desires, the complete righteousness he wants from us, we look at ourselves and see that we are totally inadequate. We have not lived up to that at all. And so the law brings us to a recognition of what our problem is. Sometimes you know, pastors, you look at St. John Chrysostom, for example, one of the great church fathers writing in the fourth century. He likes to use this analogy of, of a physician. You know, that if a physician wants to offer you some kind of mes medicine or some kind of healing, that medicine will not make any sense apart from him diagnosing you with what's actually wrong with you. Right? If you go to a doctor and the doctor just says, here, take these pills, uh, and you you have no idea why, you're going to be really confused, and you probably aren't going to take them. Um, but if the doctor instead says, oh, hey, we discovered that you have this deadly disease, and if you take these pills, they're going to save your life, uh, you're probably going to take the pills, right? So, But you need to know, you need to have the diagnosis of what's wrong with you first, before you understand the remedy. So the law is is the diagnosis. The law shows us what's wrong with us our disease of sin. And the gospel, on the other hand, shows our Savior. The gospel is that which presents to us the, the cure, the salvation from sin, how to get rid of the disease. And the cure ultimately is Jesus. So we see this description of the gospel I have cited here, which is in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, where St. Paul writes to the Corinthians and summarizes what he means by the gospel. And what is it? It's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So the gospel is, literally means good news. So the gospel is what Jesus has done. The gospel is not a command. The gospel is not me being nice to you or me doing something nice with my life. Instead, the gospel is the news of what Christ has done for sinners. So then just quickly get into some specifics. What are some distinctions between the law and the gospel? Well, first we have here the law demands perfection. God says, be perfect. We're told, be perfect as your father in heaven. 
is perfect. And see Galatians 3.10 says that uh, we are obligated, if we are under the law, we are obligated to do all the things written in the book of the law. In the law says, God's commandments say that if we do not continue to do all things in the book of the law, we are under a curse. So there's a universality. The law says you have to obey every single thing. It has to be perfect. Why? Because God is perfect. And God is our judge. And if God is going to judge by a righteous standard, that standard is perfection. And so God expects perfection from us. If we are judged according to God's law, we've got to measure up to perfection, which of course is impossible. And that's kind of the point. <laughs> uh, second, the law is conditional. And I have Deuteronomy 28 there. Read through chapter the, the chapter of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. This chapter is a section where Moses is presenting the law to the people of Israel right before they enter into the promised land, which is Deuteronomy, Deuteros Nalmas, meaning second law. And here, Paul, or Moses, sorry, <laughs> uh, Moses explains that if they're, they break the law, they're going to be all of these curses. And if they obey the law, there are going to be all of these blessings. So there is a conditionality to the law. The law says, if you do this, then God will do this. There's an if then in terms of the law. So if you obey, you will be blessed. If you disobey, you will be cursed. It's conditional. The law brings us to a knowledge of sin. Point number three, Romans 7, this whole text is Paul explaining how he comes to know the reality of a sin. He says, I wouldn't have known sin. If the law said, do not covet, they wouldn't have recognized that my coveting was sin. So the law is like a mirror that shows us who we are. It, it shows us our sin. It brings us to a knowledge of the reality and the seriousness of our sins. And then the final point, this is the most obvious one. Exodus 20 is cited here, which is just the first giving of the Ten Commandments. There are two instances of listing out of the Ten Commandments in the Torah. And this is just that the law is a command. I mean, this is the obvious one. It's a way of speaking, right? The law is a way of, of communicating. So God communicates to us by ways of command. He says, do this, don't do this. The gospel. So let's talk about the gospel. What distinguishes it from the law? First, the gospel, rather than demanding perfection for us, presents Christ's perfection. And I have Romans 6, 1, 16 and 17, that the gospel is the power of God and salvation. And, and it, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. So the gospel reveals to us the righteousness of Jesus. That indeed, we do get to stand before God perfect, but not because we've been so good, but because we are forgiven, but because Christ is perfect and his forgiveness and his mercy is perfect. And then the second point about the gospel is that it is unconditional. Unlike the conditionality of the law, which says, if you do this, then this, the gospel simply says, God will do this, or God has done this for you. So you can read Genesis 15, which is the, the covenant that God gives to Abraham, and God does this while Abraham is asleep. It's an unconditional covenant. God just simply says, Abraham, I'm going to do this. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless all nations through you, which ultimately culminates in the sending of Jesus. The gospel overcomes sin. So we have the law brings a knowledge of sin, but actually, as much as it seems like the law would be then the thing that would help us to overcome sin, it actually doesn't. The gospel gives us the power to overcome sin. Through the gospel comes the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, and the Holy Spirit helps us to overcome sin in our lives, though the reality also is that that won't happen perfectly until death. So in this life, we're always going to be struggling with sin, but we do battle with this, this new spirit that God has made within us through the Holy Spirit and through this renewed nature that we are given. And then finally, in terms of the way of speaking, the gospel is a promise. So I mentioned Genesis 15 here. The gospel is a promise from God saying, I will do this for you. The gospel tells us you are forgiven. The gospel tells us you will be raised on the last day. Christ died for you. These are promises that God gives. So God speaks in these two different ways, law and gospel. Okay, then we have the next section here is the sacraments. So here's what's going to then distinguish the Lutheran theology from a lot of other more Protestant theologies. Now, Lutherans sometimes don't like to consider themselves Protestant. 
I'm okay with the term Protestant, but I also get why Lutherans don't like the term Protestant, because we are very different from those, at least in an American context, that are considered Protestants, because we are we're sacramental, we are liturgical, and in many ways, there are many areas where we share more commonality with, say, the Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox traditions than we do with many of, say, the you know, Baptist or maybe non-denominational uh, traditions. So, the sacraments are where when you're talking to your you know, evangelical friends as a Lutheran, they look at you like you're a little weird, right? <laughs> so, they say, what? <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about the sacraments in general, and then we're going to move on to talking about the sacraments a little more specifically. So, first we have this idea of the means of grace that is kind of an overarching theme that encapsulates sacraments, but it also encapsulates other things like the Word of God. So, when you're hearing Lutherans talk, or you're reading Lutherans, or you're listening to a Lutheran pastor, you're going to hear the phrase word and sacrament over and over and over and over again. Word and sacrament, word and sacrament, word and sacrament. And the reason for that is because the, the word of God and the sacraments are both considered means of grace. In other words, these are means that God uses to deliver his gifts to us. He uses physical, real things to bring his grace to us. So, generally, God does not work immediately, but he works immediately. Uh, an immediate working of God would be that, you know, say you're just sitting there in your room one day, and all of a sudden you get a direct vision from God, and, and God says to you, hey, repent, believe in Jesus, this is who Jesus is, and all of a sudden you're converted. And, well, yeah, in Scripture, there are occasional times where God does that. We see that with the call of the prophets, for example. That is not usually how God works. So, usually, God is working through pretty ordinary stuff. He works through means, which means that he brings people to faith, he brings people to a knowledge of himself through preachers, through reading the Bible, through the sacraments. These are all things that God uses to bring people to himself. And so, these are what we call means of grace. Now, God uses physical things to accomplish his will, and he always has. So, this is something that we see all throughout the Old and New Testament. For example, even back in the Garden of Eden itself, even when we do have God walking directly with Adam in the Garden, he still is using physical stuff to give spiritual life to Adam and Eve. This is why we have in the Garden the Tree of Life. Not the Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil, that's there too. There's also a Tree of Life which is a, a sacramental tree, a tree that whatever fruit was there, whatever was partaken of it, it would give life to Adam and Eve. We see plenty of other examples. I mentioned here 2 Kings chapter 5. We have the story of, of Naaman, uh, who has leprosy, and he's told to dip into the Jordan River. And as he dips into the Jordan River, his leprosy is cured. Did God have to use that water? Was that water somehow so miraculous that it just naturally healed Naaman? Of course not. But God chose to use the physical thing to accomplish his will for Naaman. Then we have this in the life of Jesus all the time. So, I mentioned one example, which is in John 9, where we have a blind man and Jesus takes some dirt, spits in it. We've got mud and he rubs it on the guy's face and all of a sudden he can see. So, God chose to use this physical stuff, this dirt, to bring forth his grace and healing. And so, this is what God does all throughout the Bible. So, the sacraments are another example of something that God does, not as kind of magic, but just as a means that God uses to deliver his grace. So, what exactly is it then that constitutes what we mean by a sacrament? Because different Christian traditions use the word sacrament in some different ways to mean different things. Now, sacrament itself, it's not a biblical term. It does come from you know, a Latin translation, the Latin Vulgate, uh, which uses the term sacramentum, which means a, a mystery, essentially. But the way that the church uses the term sacrament has really been more of an ecclesiastical thing. In other words, it's been just a theological term that people have used to characterize things that are in Scripture. Uh, but generally how the Lutheran tradition then would define sacrament, to make it a little more particular to know what we're talking about, we, we talk about three different elements that make a sacrament. The first of these is that it is instituted directly by Jesus. So, it's something that is given to the church for the church's continual observance that Jesus himself delivers to the church. Uh, the second is that there is some kind of physical element attached to it. So, we have in baptism, water. In Holy Communion, we have bread and wine. 
often very ordinary earthly elements, just like God uses the ordinary element of dirt to heal a blind man. And then the third element of a sacrament is that it gives a promise of grace. So it is something not just that merely symbolizes something. It's not just like a, a sign or a symbol in something like, you know, making the sign of the cross, for example, right? Lutherans often make the sign of the cross. I make the sign of the cross all the time, you know, in my own prayer and in, in church. But we recognize that's not something God instituted. It's not something we have to do, absolutely. It is a helpful reminder, a helpful sign to us to get our bodies involved in worship. But there is no grace promised to us if we do that because it's a tradition that it's not something that God himself ordained and said that he was going to work through that to give grace. So that distinguishes certain things from those which are you know, traditions or even things that are very good to do, uh, but they're not given this promise of grace. Okay, then we have finally the question of how many sacraments are there? So how many things fit this definition? Well, we've clearly at least got two. So that is baptism and the Eucharist. Both of those things have, they're instituted by Christ, these physical elements, and they give a promise of grace. Sometimes Lutherans talk about a third sacrament. Luther does this, but within the Lutheran tradition, we see people kind of going back and forth often between two or three. So the third is absolution. That's through the, the mouth of the pastor, the pastor can tell people they are forgiven and God actually forgives through the word of the pastor. This is what we call the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We'll be getting into that as well. And the reason why this is not always considered a sacrament is simply because it's not quite as clear in terms of that physical element. So some people say, well, the pastor himself becomes the physical element. And others say, ah, I don't know about that because, you know, when the pastor's preaching, he's a physical element too, but we don't call preaching a sacrament. We, we call it the word. So whatever you want to do with it, it, it doesn't really matter that much what kind of label you put on it. So we got two or three. And then you've got people that want to use a broader definition of sacrament and, you know, not, not worth wrangling over the, the specifics, but that's, uh, because it's a term that's not directly scriptural. So if you want to use the term more broadly, I guess that's okay. You just have to kind of explain what you mean by it. All right. Then we've got the specifics. So we're going to delve into what are the sacraments more particularly. Well, first we've got holy baptism, the most foundational sacrament. So how was it done? How are you baptized? Well, we have really two things. We've got the application of water. So the water is applied to the person being baptized. You don't do it yourself. <laughs> you are baptized. Someone does it for you. That's part of the nature of baptism. It's, it's that passive thing. You know, you're not doing it for yourself, but it's being given to you because it is a divine means of grace. It's, it's a promise of God. Uh, so it is done with the application of water. Some traditions get very particular about exactly how you do it. You have to dunk or you have to sprinkle or you have to pour. We're okay with all of those. Scripture doesn't command one particular mode. And, and there are some examples, I think, of each of those in scripture, which is precisely why people can argue so much about it. Um, but we say it doesn't matter as long as it's applied to you and it's water. So we, we don't baptize with you know, chocolate milk or something, but uh, so use water. And the second is it has to have the invocation of the triune name, the words that Jesus instituted. So these, these are, you know, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so those are the words in Matthew 28 that Jesus delivers to the church. So those are the words that we use. So it has to have both of those elements, the application of water, and then the word of God coming in and with the water to make it baptism. So it's not merely pouring water on yourself or someone pouring water on you that constitutes baptism. You're not baptized every time you take a, take a shower or a bath or something. Okay, then what are its benefits? So what does baptism do? Well, the first point here, and this is where a lot of debate is, but I can't get into that too much here, is that baptism is not man's work, but it is God's work. Baptism is not a work of law. It is not a command. I am not fulfilling some kind of righteous duty when I get baptized. Instead, it is God's doing. It is not works. And I have a reference here to Titus chapter 3, where Paul uses the phrase that is the washing of regeneration, which is specifically set as distinct from works. Baptism unites us to Christ. It brings us into the reality of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. That's that subjective justification we were talking about, that we are brought into the reality of Christ's own death and resurrection as we are baptized and we are united to him. So Romans 6, 3, it brings the forgiveness of sins. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16, be baptized and wash away your sins. In other words, if you are baptized, your sins are being washed away. It gives the Holy Spirit. 
This is in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, at the end of Peter's sermon at, at Pentecost. Uh, be baptized, you'll receive the forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism saves. There's that, that, that word, you know, when somebody says, you know, are you saved? If you've been baptized, well, you were saved, according to St. Peter. 1 Peter 3, 21 says, baptism now saves you. And he has a connection there to the Ark of the Covenant. Then we have uh, that baptism gives spiritual life, Colossians 2, verses 12 through 13. Finally, it regenerates, or it makes you born again, John 3, 5, that you have to be born of water and the Spirit, as Jesus tells Nicodemus. So that's what baptism does. Those are the benefits that baptism gives. Then we have the question, well, who is it for? Who is to be baptized? Well, let's look at some of the things that Scripture says. Matthew 28, 19 tells us that baptism is for all nations. This is part of the Great Commission, that baptism and discipling is for all nations. And what's significant about that is that this is a universal thing. When we look at, say, the, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, well, there were benefits for other nations in terms of the covenant God made with Israel. The covenant was really with particularly the nation of Israel. So now baptism, however, is something that is broader. Right? It's, it's for more people than the Old Covenant was for. Uh, and if the Old Covenant was for Israelites and included infants, there's no reason to think that infants would not be included now, that it's become more universal, not less. Now it's for all nations. It's for men and women, unlike you know circumcision, which was just for, for men. Uh, we also see that there is this practice of household baptisms, Acts 16.33, and I have a lot on this subject, but this is just one example. We have a number of these in Scripture where when we see somebody has a household, there are children in the house, that when that person is baptized, the children are also baptized. So there is an expectation that if you are baptized, so are, are your children, those who are in your household. So this is why we apply baptism to not just adults, but also to infants. Because if baptism really does give all of these benefits that we see, it unites to Christ, it forgives sins, it grants the Holy Spirit, it saves, it gives spiritual life, it regenerates, then we simply have to say, well, do infants need those things too? And I think the question's pretty clear. So God desires to give his grace and mercy to infants, just as he does uh, to all of us. All right, then we have the, the second sacrament, and that is the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist, or Holy Communion, or the Sacrament of the Altar, we can use all of these terms, and they're all good terms, and they all highlight different elements of this, this sacrament. Um, but we're going to ask th that same question, you know, how is it done, and then what is it giving? So, what is it that we are to do in terms of the Lord's Supper? How, how is it to be done? Well, uh, Jesus commanded specific elements, uh, and he said that we should use two, bread and wine. And that bread and wine is, you know, the bread is to be eaten and the wine is to be drunk. Take eat, take drink. And so we have bread that is eaten and we have wine that we drink. Those things are necessary to observe Jesus's commandments. Now, they're pretty straightforward, but churches tend to deviate very often from what Jesus explicitly said to do is even though it's quite easy uh, and they do this in all different ways you see churches that decide that they're not going to use bread that they're going to do something else or they're not going to use wine that they have to use grape juice or they have to use i don't know water or and yeah other groups that, that that do that or some that say like yeah you could do you know use snickers and coke it's kind of the same thing because it's just a remembrance of jesus anyway we're gonna say it's a lot more than just a remembrance of jesus um, also, you do have churches that practice things like intinction, where instead of drinking the wine, you you know you dip the host or the bread in the wine and then eat. Well, Jesus did say take drink. So, in, in terms of the commands of Jesus, he does say take eat, take drink, and so we should eat and drink, as he commanded us to. Now, there of course is the you know other situation, the situations that arise of severe you know allergies that you know you're going to you know, die if you have, you know, gluten or something. And yes, you, you can accommodate those kinds of situations. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of how the church should be trying to observe the sacrament, do as close to what Jesus commanded as you possibly can. And you don't make the exception the rule. Okay. All right. So 
Uh, then also it is to be done in the community of the local church. Right? First Corinthians eleven thirty three. It's very clear that in Scripture communion is something that is to be done within the communion of the church because there is this horizontal element as well as this vertical together of believers. So there is no such thing as virtual communion. You cannot take communion online. You cannot take communion, you know, by yourself at at the dinner table because you happen to have bread and wine or just with your family randomly at home. No, there is a particular um, setting in which communion is to be taken. It's with the body of Christ. It is as you are gathered together uh, for worship. Okay, then the other element that needs to be there in terms of communion is the words of institution. And these are the words that Jesus gave. Just like in baptism, he gave those specific words. In communion, he gives these words, which are those words, take, eat, this is my body given for you. You know, we have the words of institution. So Jesus gave us the words to say and the elements to use. So we have, we have all three of these things that have to come together, right? We've got the elements, we have the proper setting, which is the community of the church coming together to receive the body and blood of Christ. And then we have the pastor reciting the words of institution, which are the words of Jesus. And as those three things come together, this now is the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. So what does it give? Uh, first point, it gives the true body and blood of Jesus. In, in Holy Communion, we receive the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And this is not merely symbolic. Is his actual body or his true body or his real body. Those words are, are used to just clarify that when we say body, we mean body. And when we say blood, we mean blood. Because this is what Jesus says. This is my body. This is my blood. Uh, okay. And there are a lot of other arguments for that too, but I've got <laughs> plenty of videos on that that you can find uh, on the channel otherwise. Uh, the second thing that is given is the forgiveness of sins, Matthew 26, 28. So why, why does Jesus give his body and blood? Well, because those, that's what's given then on the cross following the Last Supper for the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins is delivered through that crucified body and blood of our Lord Jesus. We also are given a kind of participation in Christ. We, we share in Christ. There is something mystical happening in community. There's something mysterious going on that we are participating in the reality of who Jesus is in some intimate way. But beyond that, we are also participating in, in the mystical body that is the church. So, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says a lot here about the, the horizontal element of the supper, that we share both in the body of Christ as in the, the person of Christ, our Savior, but we also share in the church. We become one with those who are part of the mystical body of Jesus in the church. Then we get this, this next element, uh, which is the sometimes called the third sacrament, as we said, but... Some people don't like to use the term sacrament to refer to this, which is okay, and that is absolution. So oftentimes we refer to this as the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, this is a phrase that's used by Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus grants the keys of the kingdom of heaven to St. Peter upon St. Peter's confession. So he confess confesses that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus says, says, um, you are Peter on this rock, I will build my church, and then he gives them the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We're not going to get into the whole Pope debate about Peter here. <laughs> Again, plenty of other places on here that, that you could get into that. Uh, but the, the primary point that we're looking at here is just that he is given the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which are then identified with the forgiveness of sins and the retaining of sins. Now, in Matthew 18, Jesus speaks about the keys and their function in the church. The church as a whole has the authority or power to use these keys. So it's not merely to Peter, it's then given to the church as a whole. Then we see in John chapter 20, just prior to Jesus' ascension, he gives these keys again to the apostles. He breathes on, on the apostles, the 11 at the time, Judas certainly isn't there, and Matthias has not been chosen quite yet. He breathes on the apostles and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them the same thing that he tells to Peter, that they now have the authority to forgive sins. So it's given first to Peter upon his confession. It's, the keys are given to the whole church, and then they are given to the apostles. Now, who are the apostles? They are the leaders of the church. They're the representatives of the church. And so those keys are given to the church as a whole, as we see in Matthew 18. But who exercises the authority of those keys? Well, the leaders of the church, just as the apostles were, which is why we have pastors today that exercise that same office of the keys. 
What are these keys for? Well, two things, and they're reiterated all in all of these places, which are one, the, the key is used to open the door of heaven, right? To deliver the, the forgiveness of sins so that if you confess your sins, you are forgiven. Uh, but the second thing the keys are for is locking the doors of heaven, and that is retaining sins, that there is a role for the church to say your sins are not forgiven if they are not forgiven. If someone refuses to repent, if they are confronted, because the goal is always forgiveness. The goal, the goal is always restoration. We don't, we don't get to say, well, I don't like you, so I'm not going <laughs> to deliver the forgiveness of sins. That's not how this works. Um, but the retaining of sins is to say, look, if you refuse to repent, if you will not turn away from your sins, then they're not forgiven. Forgiveness is granted in repentance. And if there is no repentance, you can't deliver the forgiveness of sins. Okay, then we've got just a, a, two more slides here. So uh, and there's a lot of information here. We can get a lot more in depth into all these. I have a very long video series, uh, you know, 20 something hours on Christology if you want to get into this. But just just we'll, we'll go quickly through this Christology, the the centeredness of Lutheran theology on Jesus. Uh, Lutheran theology is very Christocentric, which means Christ-centered, and Lutheran theology is really uniquely centered on the person and work of Jesus above all else. And so, what does it mean that we have a Christocentric theology? Well, first, God is known through the revelation of His Son, and so when we talk about God, that is almost always, because we do have a place for natural theology as well, but pretty much always a Christian knowledge of God is going to be through Jesus. We're going to look at the character of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and say, that is how I know who God is. That is where I find God. Second, it is only through Christ that sins are forgiven. We understand that the, the forgiveness of sins, the gift of salvation, are only and always grounded in the person and work of Jesus. There is no other Savior. There is no other way that sins can be forgiven. I then have a quote here from the theologian David Scare, uh, which is a very well-known quote, and I think it summarizes Luther, a Lutheran approach to theology well, which is this. All theology is Christology. So no matter what we're talking about, you're going to, we're going to go back to Jesus, specifically the saving work of Jesus for you. This is something you see in Lutheran theological papers. If you go to a conference and hear Lutherans present, it's something you see in Lutheran preaching that we always go back to Christ. And the fourth aspect of this Christocentric theology is that we understand that both the Old and New Testaments are about Jesus, so that the entirety of the biblical narrative is one consistent story, and it is a consistent story that tells us about Jesus and who he is and uh, what he has done. In terms of how we view Christ's person, how we understand Jesus, we accept the ecumenical creeds of the church. We confess the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and the Athanasian Creed, which we refer to as the ecumenical creeds. The, the Athanasian is really a Western creed, not an Eastern creed, and the Apostles are similar, and the Nicene, we use the Western version. So, <laughs> so they're at least all ecumenical in the West. Um, and then uh, we do emphasize in Lutheran theology, the the unity of the person of Jesus. And, and this specifically is something that shows up in debates that Martin Luther has with Ulrich Zwingli, the kind of founder of Reformed theology in some ways, the, the pre-Calvin, uh, though he does differ from Calvin in some ways. And Zwingli essentially argued that Christ's body and blood cannot be present in the Lord's Supper because the human nature of Christ is solely at the right hand of God the Father in a literal physical place and can't be anywhere else. And in the midst of that debate, Luther said, well, because of the unity of the person of Christ, the divine nature can work through the human nature so that the human nature of Jesus can do some pretty extraordinary things that our human natures could not do. And, and so that's that sets the groundwork in many ways from, for um, our understanding of the unity of Christ's natures. Largely, that's taken from uh, Cyril of Alexandria and John of Damascus, uh, two important church fathers that write about this. And then the, the third of these, uh, this Christocentric element is a Christocentric salvation, which is the first, the understanding that all of the benefits of salvation are grounded upon the life and work of Christ, meaning that whatever gifts of salvation that I receive were first in the life and person of Jesus, and I only receive because I'm brought into the reality of Jesus. So in my baptism, I'm brought into the reality of Jesus' baptism, which is why you know he received the Holy Spirit and his baptism, and I only receive the Holy Spirit through baptism because I'm connected to Jesus. He's declared righteous just as I am declared righteous, not because of me, but because I'm 
connected with him and his righteousness. This is true of all of the elements of our of our salvation. Uh, and, you know, th this is partially why when I'm talking about th this idea of sanctification or your good works or your renewal in life, um, I tend to use the term Christification, this, this idea that Christ is formed in us, that my good works are actually the works of Christ in and through me, that I am united to, to him. I participate in God as Christ did, but only in and through Christ. And Luther speaks about us being little Christs to our neighbor. That's what our good works are. It's, it's really Christ working in and through us mystically. So we talk about this mystical union that we have with God uh, in the presence of Christ in, in faith, working in and through us. Christ alone is our righteousness quorum Deo, meaning before God, that my righteousness before God is not in any way what is in me, but it is Jesus himself. And then the third point here is Christ's saving work is universal in scope and intent, meaning that Christ's life, death, and resurrection uh, were, were accomplished on, be, on behalf of the entirety of humanity, not just the elect. Uh, and, and this, to just to clarify, this is not an absolute universalism in that we do not believe that those who are without faith are going to share in, in eternal life, but Christ's work and the intent of his work was universal so that all those who are connected to that work through faith will share ultimately in eternal life through the benefits of Jesus. And then the, the final point here uh, is, is saving grace. Now, how, how is it that we understand saving grace? And this often shows up with the questions of the Calvinist versus Arminian debates. Lutherans don't fit neatly into either of those categories. And, and so oftentimes, because of that, people are confused by what we believe. <laughs> so just some, some basic points to start us off here. Uh, the first is we believe that saving grace is universal, so that uh, God does not only give saving grace to, to the elect, but God desires the salvation of all, and thus, as he works through the means of grace, he desires to bring all people to himself. But we also confess that God's grace is resistible. In other words, though God desires the salvation of all, it is possible for sinners to resist that grace of God and thus forfeit salvation. The third point in terms of saving grace here is that it is applied through means rather than God's absolute power. And what, what we're saying here is if God wanted to simply just convert everyone in an instant by his absolute power, of course he could have. It's not like our, our wills are so powerful that they can resist God, <laughs> but God could easily just convert us all in a, in a moment. However, there is an understanding that God has, for whatever reason, in God's you know, inscrutable will, has chosen that he would work resistibly, not irresistibly. He would not work by his pure absolute power as he did in creation in terms of our conversion, but instead that he would tie himself to means. So he would work through those, those means, which we talk about as the means of grace. The fourth point is that Faith is granted as a gift. Faith is not something that is the result of, of human decision or human rationality, but it is something that God does, that the Spirit creates uh, within the people of God through those means of grace. Um, God is the sole cause of conversion. His grace is the sole cause of our conversion. In other words, if I convert to Christianity, I don't get to take credit myself and say, well, I was just really smart. No, if I am converted, I am converted because God has given his grace to me and God has changed my will so that I have been given the gift of faith and trust in him. Faith and saving grace, in our view, can be walked away from, Galatians 5, 4, you cut off from Christ. So that there is a possibility, uh, according to scripture, of a, a true regenerate believer to walk away from the grace of God. We certainly know many people who have been baptized who are not walking in the faith today. That does not mean that they are still saved, but it also does not mean that their baptism was ineffectual. What it means is that those people have rejected baptismal grace and God's promises and have walked away. Saving grace is no divine necessity, but it's given out of free love. In other words, God is not under any obligation to save humanity at all. God would be perfectly just in just leaving humanity in our state of sin and not offering any grace or salvation. But thankfully, he doesn't do that because God is merciful, God is loving, God is self-giving. And so it's not out of any necessity, but out of free and pure unmerited love that God decides 
to bring salvation to us on this earth. And the final point about saving grace is that, like everything else in our theology, it is grounded in the person and the work of Jesus Christ and him alone. Well, that is it here for our brief summary of Lutheran theology. I'm kind of amazed that I kept it as short as I did. <laughs> I was I was worried that this would be a complete impossibility because there are so many things to talk about, um, but somehow I was able to do it. So uh, I hope you like these you know introductory videos. Uh, let me know if you want me to keep doing them or if you have other ideas of things to do in this series that would be helpful. I'm definitely thinking about doing one that would be the Lutheran Confessions, maybe one that would be, you know, the history of Lutheranism, just these kind of brief, broad overview. I'm interested in this topic, but I don't have time to listen to 30 hours of talks on it, which is often what I do. <laughs> so um, hopefully you find this helpful. So thanks so much for watching and or listening. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and subscribe on whatever podcast app it is that you use, and we'll see you in the next one. God bless.